Okay, so uh, yesterday I have uh, stopped at uh, considering uh, the Darwin uh, instability, and this is uh, second but last of the elements in the or the definition of building blocks that I promised in the beginning. So, uh, if you consider the total angular momentum like uh, over there, so it's I omega rotation of the big star plus the angular uh, momentum of the, this is two thirds, if I remember, two thirds, and if we different that, then we get a zero because this is conserved, and then it's I B omega rotation uh, plus mu G M to two thirds where uh, omega to four thirds and we have um, minus one third D omega orb orbital. So from here we can get I D omega rot, rot times omega rot divided by omega rotation is equal to one third mu G M to two thirds over omega to one third orb one d omega orb over omega orb and we can identify uh, this part as j rotation we can identify this part as j orbital and from here we can get the formula for the ratio of the uh, orb, which would be uh, J orbital over J rotation. Uh, there is one third here, one third, uh, and then we have omega rotation over omega orbital. So you see that uh, from the discussion I uh, tried to sketch yesterday, if, uh, well, the, the stability con condition for uh, circularization is such that uh, if omega rot and orbit, uh, omega orbital are uh, close, uh, you will have the uh, stable cor rotation if the uh, rotational uh, angular momentum is smaller than a third of the uh, orbital uh, uh, angular momentum. And otherwise, if we have a situation like I've shown you yesterday, when we have a, a star with big, uh, with relatively large um, moment uh, of inertia, and uh, it, and, and the smaller stars, and, and we have uh, strong uh, tidal forces here. Attempt of um, uh, to to bring this system to uh, synchronization, then uh, the result will be unstable, and this star, the, the system will start to uh, come together. Uh, the semi-major axis will decrease and uh, uh, we'll have pr initialization of uh, mass transfer and probably a common envelope or a merger. So uh, that's about this. And now uh, uh, the supernova. So uh, supernovae are an essential part of making compact object binaries because we want the stars to end their nuclear phase. I don't like the, uh, the expression that the 
stars and their lives because I think that neutron stars have beautiful lives and <laughs> that they are they, they they shouldn't be considered any dead in comparison to uh, the nuclear burning uh, stars. So uh, that's why I don't use, I don't like to use the death of a star expression. So what can a supernova do to uh, to a binary? A uh, supernova explosion, from the point of view of um, one of a binary, so we have a binary, say it's circular, uh, and uh, the time scale for a supernova is the dynamical time scale. So it is of the order, you know, the total event, including collapse and ejection of uh, the matter, is uh, probably of the order of total of tens of minutes. Uh, it is a time scale uh, that is much shorter than most of the typical uh, orbital time scales for pre uh, supernova binaries. So essentially, the supernova happens instantaneously for, uh, for a star. And so, so from the point of view of, uh, of a binary, a supernova is an event when we replace M1 with M, say, neutron star, if we make a neutron star like this <laughs> in the binary, uh, and we remove the outer envelope just send it out, and we send it out with a huge velocity. Typical velocities of the supernova uh, ejecta are in excess of thousands or tens of thousands of kilometers per second. So from the point of view of the binary, the mass is removed like this. It just disappears up and goes away out of, uh, of the binary. The typical orbital velocities will be of the order of, you know, if, if, if for the Earth-Sun system, the orbital velocity is 30 kilometers per second, so uh, for tighter systems, the orbital velocities can be of the order of 50 to 100 kilometers per second for uh, tight systems. So this is much smaller than the velocity with which we throw out the matter and remove the, uh, the ejecta. So uh, what is the effect? of uh, such, a, uh, such a maneuver that we uh, suddenly replace M1 with uh, M uh, neutron star. Um, the, the binary will, well, the, 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 you know, in the first approximation, if we forget about the, uh, the kicks, uh, we just have the binary suddenly realizes that, well, okay, I have the same velocity, I'm sitting in the same place, but uh, there is a little bit less gravity between us, yeah? because my mass is now lower. Uh, so uh, what can happen is, what, what will happen is that this, the orbit will be changed. So how it's going to be, to be changed? Let me just uh, go to this calculation, but there is another complication. The fact that we know that the supernova uh, explosions are not uh, symmetric. And because they are not symmetric, the newly formed neutron stars receive natal kicks. They receive additional velocities because uh, the, uh, because of um, momentum conservation, because the, say, uh, neutrino emission during the formation of a neutron star is not symmetric, so there is some net momentum flowing away uh, out of the system, not only with the uh, removal of the envelope, which doesn't have to be spherical as well. So uh, a neutron star will get a kick, and the, these kicks have been estimated, measured, and they are typically of the order of 100 to a few hundred kilometers per second. And we know them because we observe young neutron stars as pulsars, and we can measure their proper motions 
uh, in the sky, uh, so we know that their velocities are much larger than the typical velocities of stars, of massive stars or normal stars in the disk. The typical dispersion of velocities of stars in the disk is about 20 kilometers, 10 to 20 kilometers per second, while uh, these uh, guys fly away at uh, the uh, 100 to a few hundred kilometers per second. And there have been really uh, detailed studies to estimate the uh, distribution of these velocities. So we know that the, this can be modeled by a Gaussian uh, or, or Maxwellian distribution of velocities with the characteristic width of about 200 kilometers per second. So apart from uh, the fact that we have you know, this, the orbital velocities here, okay, this is the orbital velocity, we can have also an additional kick velocity that will uh, also and if we uh, uh, do the, f you know, if we uh, interfere with a uh, binary, but not only by replacing mass m1 with mass new m neutron star, but also changing the velocity, the orbit will uh, change. So I will sketch you sketch a calculation of what happens with the, uh, uh, with the velocities and with the, with the orbit, such a. Okay, so uh, we assume that the binary is circular before the, uh, the, the, the explosion. And we uh, and we'll use the, so, uh, okay, in the binary, we can write that the uh, relative or orbital velocity is equal to gm over a, that's velocity, the orbital velocity squared. Now, uh, after the uh, explosion, uh, the orbital velocity will become v plus v kick. Yeah? So the square of the orbital velocity will be v orb squared plus v kick squared plus two v kick v orb like this. Yeah? Uh, so uh, let's uh, make our life a little bit simpler and introduce a dimensionless parameter which is v kick divided by v orbital. So it's the relative value of the uh, kick velocity magnitude in comparison to the orbital velocity. And that's a natural para parameter to introduce because the orbital velocity is the natural you know, value of the uh, velocity. So we can write v squared as uh, v orbital squared times uh, plus v rel squared plus 2 v relative squared times cosine theta. Yep. Uh, okay. So uh, now to find if the system is going to be bound uh, after the supernova explosion, uh, we have to find its total energy and uh, see wh whether it's negative or positive. So uh, we can calculate the total energy of the system after the supernova explosion by uh, noticing that uh, right after the supernova explosion, the two new masses are at the separation of A, and what changes is the relative velocity, but we can add the kinetic and potential energy and find the energy after the uh, explosion. So uh, this energy will be minus g mass of neutron star mass 2 divided by a, let's call it a initial, yeah, plus 
a half mu and s, this is the uh, reduced mass after the expansion, uh, times v squared. And this is the v that uh, I calculated here. Yep. Uh, so this is equal minus g m and s m 2 over a i plus 1 half m 2 m neutron star over m 2 plus m neutron star uh, times uh, v orbital squared v orbital squared times 1 plus v rel squared plus 2 v rel theta. Yep. And uh, we can insert, we know what the orbital was because this is the, the value before the uh, supernova explosion. So this is minus g m and s over a i plus one half And this is G M, and this is the M total before the uh, uh, M one plus M two divided by A I times one plus two V cos theta. Yeah. Uh, but since this is the total energy of a system, the total energy of a system of uh, two bodies uh, uh, is just, you know, by definition, a uh, total is equal to uh, minus g s over 2a phi. Whatever, that's uh, always true for a a uh, system of two bodies, whether it's bound or not, not bound. If, if it's bound, then A is uh, positive. It's, if it's unbound, A will be uh, negative. But uh, no, this is just the, uh, the result. So we can... This is minus M2. So we can compare the two values, and that will give us the final uh, orbital separation as a function of the masses and the initial orbital separation and this relative um, velocity. So, let's, uh, let's do it. Uh, maybe I can get rid of this wonderful drawing. So we have uh, if we equate this and that, uh, we can uh, get rid of uh, the um, uh, minuses and just divide it by that uh, gm2 and s over there. So we have uh, a i over a final equals to 2 minus Mm. And we have uh, M1 plus M2 over M N S plus M2 times the this velocity factor. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, just, oh, I didn't turn on my timer. <laughs> so I see I have another one here. So I'll, I'll know more or less what to do and how far to go. Uh, so what does, that, what does this mean? Uh, this is, uh, we can discuss the, this result in a uh, short while. So if phi kick is zero, then v relative is zero, then what we get is that 
ai minus a by af is 2 minus this ratio of the mass m1 plus m2 over m1 plus m neutron star. And uh, for a system to be bound, this has to be positive, yeah? Because we want A final to be positive, so the ratio has to be positive. So um, what does that mean? That means that uh, M1 plus M2 to M1 plus 2M and S minus 2M minus M1 minus M2 is greater than zero. So we have uh, M2 uh, Minus, uh, M2, it's M2. Okay, yes. M2 plus M neutron star. 2M2 plus 2M N S minus M. One minus M uh, so we have M two minus M one. What the uh, two plus M and S. Okay. Two plus two. Mm -hmm. divided by M and S greater than zero. Mm -hmm. Something is uh, not working like I wanted to work. Uh, excuse me? One minus M Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just uh, M1 minus M neutron star. Yeah, I just have to put the uh, M1 minus M neutron star because uh, this, the, the, uh, what I'm aiming at is that the eject mass uh, has to be uh, less than uh, uh, half. Half M1 plus M2. Half M1 plus M2. So let me just do it again. So this has to be greater than zero, so uh, okay, M1 plus M2 must be greater than 2M2 plus MNS. Uh, so M1 plus M2 greater than 2M2 plus 2MNS. And <coughs> mm, so we'll have M uh, M two uh, and uh, uh, we'll have M one minus mass of the neutron star is greater than M two plus M neutron star. So the mass uh, uh, at mass of the neutrons okay, let me introduce the mass ejected here. So D M is M 
1 minus m neutron star. Somehow I'm getting confused again because this is so not what I wanted to have. I'm just, <laughs> I got stuck on something simple, uh, and... Look it out, calculate the energy, show the energy you see, mm -hmm. negative. Yeah. So the system will be found. Mm -hmm. Just with this simple thing, I, uh, I'm, I, I just, I'm not getting what I wanted to get, so... used to be okay so m1 plus m2 must be greater than 2m2 plus 2 mns uh, and uh, Okay, so let me do it this way. Okay, 2 minus m1 plus m2 by mns plus m2 must be greater than 0. So uh, let me write <coughs> m1 as m neutron star plus dm. Yeah, this is uh, mns. Or, no, let me write uh, do the following. Let me write m neutron star as m1 minus d m, yeah? Uh, and I'll try to calculate the dm uh, to, uh, to find what is the constraint on the amount of mass that is thrown out. So uh, 2 is uh, greater than uh, m1, okay, 2. 2 times uh, m1 minus d m plus m2 is uh, greater than m1 plus m2. So <coughs> 2m1 minus 2d m plus 2m. 2 greater of m1 plus m2, and uh, we have 2 delta m is smaller than m1 plus m2. If I, yes, so delta m is smaller than m1 plus m2 divided by 2. Okay. So I got a little bit confused. So uh, in the case that the relative velocity is uh, zero, we, if we shed more than half of the total mass of the system, then the system becomes unbound. Uh, now uh, the... The kicks uh, can help or can, uh, can help, uh, well, can change the situation in two ways. They can make the, uh, the system remain bound or they can make the system uh, be, uh, this, uh, they, they can help disrupt the system depending on the direction of the, uh, of the kick. Uh, and of course, you know, by uh, wiggling with this, equation, we can find the condition for uh, under which, uh, no, at, at what velocity will the 
system always be disrupted. If uh, there is just a chance that the system will be disrupted, the fate of the system will depend on the uh, relative uh, direction of the orbital velocity and the kick velocity. Uh, and uh, um, for really low kicks, this will uh, always be uh, uh, the, the system will always be uh, be bound. Now, one thing to notice is that uh, even if uh, the kicks are uh, zero, the uh, the system will be affected, and it's going to be affected by the fact that the um, orbit will change. Its ellipticity, uh, it will get, get some ellipticity, and in order to find the ellipticity, we have to repeat this similar uh, calculation, but uh, just use the uh, equation for the <coughs> uh, for, 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 for the for, for the angular momentum before the uh, before the explosion and uh, after the explosion. Then, okay, there is uh, that's the. Uh, so if we have, do I have it here? Okay, so for ellipticity, if we have uh, zero ellipticity before, we can uh, equate the specific angular momentum before squared, uh, before the uh, uh, explosion with the one after the explosion where we have different mass and different A, uh, but the uh, position uh, and the velocity is uh, the same, and that will give us uh, the, an expression for uh, the ellipticity after the, uh, the explosion. And if we want to make it even more complicated, we can uh, calculate uh, the same with the kick velocity, and then we obtain a relatively uh, complicated formula for the ellipticity after the, um, uh, the explosion. Another thing that the explosion will do is that the center of mass of the system will start moving, yeah? because we eject from the system the envelope and the uh, momentum of the envelope is not zero in the center of mass before the explosion, because the center of the, 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 the center of mass of the ejected envelope is moving with the orbital velocity. So if we remove delta m with the orbital velocity from the system in one direction, then the entire system will start moving in another direction. So a system after a supernova explosion, the whole binary will get uh, a velocity. Uh, so, uh, and, and this will, and it will get this velocity even if there are no supernova natal kicks. So this phenomenon is uh, called the uh, Blau mechanism for uh, for the kicks. So if you, you know, if you have uh, more time and you'd like to go through these calculations, you can check that there is the uh, ellipticity change and what's the value of this ellipticity change, and it's a nice uh, exercise in uh, classical uh, mechanisms of a two-body problem. Another nice problem is if you have a, a binary that is disrupted, uh, to calculate the velocities at infinity of the two stars after the disruption, which involves a number of uh, uh, rotations and going from one coordinate system to another, but essentially it looks like a very simple pro problem. So now that we have all of these uh, ingredients in place, we have all of the uh, evolutionary uh, episodes that are possible in hand, uh, we can start talking about the uh, mass transfer and how the mass transfer proceeds. So uh, once we have uh, one of the components fill its Roche lobe, what will happen is that the mass transfer will, will start. Uh, the, you know already that the mass transfer will start changing the orbit. The change of the orbit will change the uh, 
size of the Roche lobe, but it's going also to change the stellar structure and uh, it will change the stellar structure uh, and, the fi uh, and we ha so we have to compare the changes in the orbit and the changes in the stellar structure that happen in the same time in order to, <laughs> to find out what is the uh, fate of a system uh, in the uh, uh, and w w whether it's uh, stable or not. So one useful formula is that uh, the change of the, uh, the of, of the <coughs> row slope radius can be easily approximated by this linear function, which uh, uh, you know if you. Uh, calculate the row slope radius uh, numerically and do all of this calculation you can verify that it's uh, that it works well for quite a wide range of uh, cues so it's a useful uh, fit formula to uh, describe what's happening with the uh, uh, with the system when we change its uh, row slope radius and there is a uh, so, so this is a, a, a table with the, with all of these values that we that I talked about. So I, I'll skip it for now, and uh, let me just sh concentrate on um, on this graph, uh, which uh, is uh, showing what will happen in the first episode of the mass transfer. Uh, it's relatively complicated, so I'll spend a little bit more time on this. So. Uh, this is the mass of the donor, and this is the uh, row slope radius. Uh, the, no, this is the distance between the the, uh, the row slope radius of the donor as a function uh, of its mass. So, if we change the mass in the system, then the system gets uh, gets tighter, and then it becomes larger again. That's uh, uh, if, if we if we exchange the mass uh, in a conservative way. So this is the mass radius relation for the donor when it begins its evolution, and here we assume, uh, for the sake of argument, and, the, and this assumption is false, that the uh, radius is a steep function of the mass, that the radius is going uh, as the fourth power of the, of the mass, so this is a very steep function. So as the donor evolves, it has a constant mass, but its radius increases because it, uh, enter, it, it is on the main sequence, and on the main sequence the radius slowly increases on the nuclear time scale. At, at some point, uh, the radius uh, reaches the field, the star fills its Roche lobe, so the radius reaches point B, starts from A, goes to B, and the star starts to transfer mass to the uh, to, its, to its companion. Yeah, so it transfers a little bit of mass and then re realizes, oops, I have a little bit less mass, so I have to contract, supposing that I can achieve. Uh, thermal uh, equilibrium. So uh, my uh, radius goes down along this line, which is parallel to that, and uh, I still wait for my radius to expand uh, because of the nuclear evolution. So es essentially the, the star will move along this line, B towards C, until the radius doesn't uh, expand anymore because of the uh, uh, because of the nuclear uh, evolution. However, as I tried to convince yesterday, the mass radius relation of the stars on the main sequence is by no means described by uh, r equal m, m to the fourth. It is rather uh, described by uh, r proportional to m, which means that if a star starts from po point A prime, it reaches uh, the, it fills the Roche lobe there, uh, starts transferring the mass, but its radius is decreasing uh, in a much slower, uh, at a much slower rate than the decrease of the uh, Roche lobe radius. So this star over, overfills its Roche lobe and goes straight to B on a very quick time scale, 
And then when uh, the mass ratio is becoming about unity, it can then follow from B to C uh, on a much uh, on the nuclear uh, time scale. And this types of this type of mass transfer is an inevitable uh, mass transfer, first mass transfers for binaries with mass ratio uh, that are not very far from uh, unity. So we have uh, this and we go to, to see. And the net effect is after the first mass transfer in a binary, uh, the initial mass, uh, the initially more massive binary transfers uh, a huge fraction of the mass to its companion, and the mass ratio is reversed. The, ma the mass uh, of the companion is now much larger, is about equal to the mass of the uh, primary, only that now the primary is evolved and maybe you just have a, a part of it or just the, the core, uh, and uh, the size of the orbit remains relatively unchanged. It has, the orbit has squeezed, but then it has uh, expanded because first we transfer from a more massive to a less massive star, and then from a less massive to more massive, so we go back to a, a larger uh, orbit. What is really, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not going to, to do this uh, uh, calculation. I'll just show you this. Uh, uh, to make you uh, appreciate uh, the uh, additional complications that we have here. And the complications are such that actually uh, when we start, you know, we, st we, we, we start from here, we go up to B, and at the same time the companion is at A prime and goes to B prime. Yeah? The companion, which is a less massive star, will evolve in a, a little bit slower way. And when the mass starts to flow on it, it's, it, it finds itself in, at point B prime. So the companion is suddenly showered with lots of mass on a time scale that it cannot control because the, uh, the mass is just coming to it from outside and it has no powers over the uh, sudden reaches that uh, come to <laughs> that star. Uh, so it has no way of reaching the uh, thermal equi equilibrium. So it's not going to move along its mass radius relation that is uh, uh, prescribed by the equilibrium formula, it is going to be out of equilibrium because uh, you know, the, the time scale for reaching equilibrium is the Kevin Hel Helmholtz time scale and it can be quite long uh, in comparison to the time scale that uh, the mass reaches that star. So its radius will expand because it, is, uh, it suddenly has a, an, an additional source of energy, you know, you, you, because the mass has been dumped on it, and its radius can uh, go up to, to point C, uh, radius and mass, while uh, the donor goes to point C here. Its mass decreases, uh, and the orbit increases uh, again. Then uh, the mass uh, transfer rate becomes uh, much more, uh, much slower. Uh, from C to D, the donor provides the mass at a nuclear uh, rate, so uh, this is uh, much slower, and both stars reach uh, some sort of uh, equilibrium. But then, uh, when uh, the, then the mass transfer ceases when the donor is in point D and acceptor is at uh, D prime uh, and then it starts uh, expanding its radius and it can uh, initiate uh, another uh, mass transfer uh, in the re reverse way when its radius uh, fills its Rauschloch, but that's uh, a, a second story. Uh, and in the extreme case, uh, these two curves can touch, so you can have a system where two stars uh, fill the Roche lobe, and uh, this is an over-contact uh, binary. There are observations of binaries that are 
engulfed in uh, uh, common uh, outer layers where the transfers are uh, essentially going both ways and the outer layers are shed uh, above, through the two point in uh, their uh, uh, common uh, rock uh, uh, potential. This shows you that uh, what complications we can get when we start dealing with mass transfers on much more uh, detailed uh, way. And uh, in, in the literature, you will find the, uh, uh, the typical uh, nomenclature that corresponds to cases A, B, and C of mass transfer, which essentially correspond to the following that remember from uh, yesterday's exercises with MESA, the radius of a star, uh, log r and log t, goes more or less like this, then goes up and like that. So if we have uh, the initiation of mass transfer here, that's case A, that's case B, and this is case C. Uh, so in the literature you will find the reference to case A, case B, case C, C and also uh, you, you can <clears throat> uh, characterize the uh, mass transfer rate as a function of its potential stability by comparing the, uh, <coughs> the Roche-Lobe uh, radius derivative as a function of mass with the uh, uh, parameters that describe the, uh, the change of the radius of the donor as if in thermal equilibrium and out, outside of uh, thermal equilibrium as a function of its, uh, of its mass. And, uh, then we, there is a different classification of transfers depending on, uh, you know, when we get, uh, compare the uh, uh, R prime uh, the, the derivative of the uh, of the uh, radius with the Roche lobe derivative, and we can have nuclear time scale, uh, thermal time scale, and hydrodynamical time scale, which is uh, unstable. So in this case, we usually can in these two cases we can describe the mass transfers using this stable mass transfer formula that uh, I derived. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, cases, and in this case, we we have to use the common envelope. Uh, usually, we have to use the common envelope uh, formalism to describe the uh, the mass transfers. So, um, the okay, the, the, this uh, classification. Uh, because uh, in, in, in that classification you can have uh, the system going, you know, in each case A, B, and C, it can go bet between these modes. So these are two independent classifications, and you may see uh, these classifications in the uh, in the literature. So uh, now that we are here. Uh, we have uh, the typical scenario for the, in the first mass transfer that uh, takes place. So it's initially type two. We have the change of uh, uh, the uh, mass uh, ratio, and when the mass ratio is inverted, the mass transfer becomes uh, stable, follows on a nuclear. Uh, transfer becomes type one, and uh, typically uh, uh, we have the uh, the result is that the, the, the mass ratio is reversed, and uh, that uh, we have the uh, uh, in in so for higher masses we can have more than mass ratio reversal. We can transfer and lose more more mass. Uh, than even just uh, in the case of simple mass ratio uh, reversal. Okay, so given that, um, 
we can uh, now move to uh, concrete cases of um, uh, binary evolution. And uh, th uh, this is my uh, slide that I like very much. We can go to the zoo of binaries. There is uh, quite a lot of them, and I will not uh, cover all of them. So uh, let me start with a few that co contain uh, compact objects, and uh, in, a, in a moment we'll go to uh, binaries that uh, contain <coughs> uh, double, no, the, the, the really important binaries for the gravitational waves is the binaries that contain compact objects. So, uh, given all of the elements that we've got, we can uh, try to construct evolutionary scenarios that lead to particular binaries. So one of the uh, uh, very widely investigated types of binaries are the so-called symbiotic stars, where we have a giant, a low-mass giant, with a compact object, white dwarf, neutron star, sometimes a uh, black hole, on a wide orbit with slow mass transfer. We see that there is mass transfer to the compact object, and the compact object is bright in UV or X in UV in the case of white dwarfs, in X rays in terms of neutron stars. Uh, and they belong to old disk populations. We can look at their metallicity, so we know that they are relatively uh, old uh, stars. So, how would you make something like that? Yeah? We have to have a giant, which is a uh, low mass star. Typically, it has a mass of about one to uh, two uh, solar masses. Uh, and we have to have a compact object. In order to obtain a compact object, we have to start from a more massive star. Yeah? So, we have to have M1, which is, in order to get a white dwarf or a neutron star, it has to be something like, say, uh, eight solar masses. Let's, let's give it a 10 to make sure it's a neutron star. And we have anion, which say two solar masses. And they are at some uh, distance. So what will be the first thing that will happen? The time scale for the evolution of this guy is much smaller than the time scale for the evolution of this star. So, in no time at all, this, this, this star will evolve uh, as a... Uh, will start increasing its radius, will uh, you know, finish its nuclear evolution, and we can get, go to case B, uh, uh, mass transfer. So we'll start a mass transfer. No, this will uh, expand. We'll have mass transfer to here. What, what type of mass transfer will there be? What will be the consequence of this mass transfer? The mass ratio is quite large. This is a much smaller mass star than this one then that means that if I, well, I have, I have it in my older, other lecture, that uh, we, the, the, and we transfer mass from more massive to a less massive star. So what will happen with the, uh, with the system when we uh, transfer mass in such, a, in such a manner? The orbit will shrink. This is a giant with a very wide, convective envelope, so uh, that means that we'll have something like a common envelope here. It's not going to be a nice transfer like, like I described a moment ago for nearly equal uh, mass uh, case, but we'll have, so, uh, if it's a common envelope, so it's a TE, this star 
will lose its envelope, will have a uh, car with, you know, for a ten solar mass, the car can have something like uh, two solar masses. Uh, the or orbit will shrink. This w the, the car is a Wolfraya star. It's a helium star. Uh, it's going to evolve very quickly. And it's going to, well, for 10 solar masses, it, it will explode as a supernova. And uh, in about a uh, few million years, we'll have a neutron star. Uh, and, uh, and a companion. And now, we have to wait a few uh, billion years for this star to start to evolve. And this star, star becomes a giant fills its Roche lobe and starts transferring mass in a stable way or onto, onto the neutron star. And we observe it uh, as a symbiotic star. And everything seems to fit because the age is old, because we had to wait a few giga years here. And the only thing that we have to worry about is that this system survives the common envelope. So the initial orbital separation has to be finely tuned. It cannot be too large, because if it's too large, there will be no mass transfer, and this star will stay far away, and uh, it will never be able to fill its Roche lobe after a couple of giga years. But it cannot be too close, because if it's too close, in the CE and, uh, event, the star will swallow the, this tiny guy, and there will be no binary left for us to uh, observe uh, today. So, the, 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 the way to start to construct uh, evolutionary uh, sequences and try to understand how uh, they look, I will uh, skip the CVs and W UMA binaries, but concentrate for on binaries with uh, compact objects, and let's try to uh, to, the, to, 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 to these objects. So, uh, in terms of accreting binaries, we have uh, three types of binaries. There are high mass X-ray binaries, low mass X-ray binaries, and uh, basically there are no intermediate mass X-ray binaries. Then we have binaries with pulsars that are neutron. Most of uh, pulsars in binaries come with uh, white dwarf companions. There is, I think, one with the main sequence star and a few very interesting ones with double, the double neutron stars, star binaries. Uh, there is, uh, so these are the binary pulsars. There is actually one real binary pulsar where we see two pulsars and other of them are uh, single pulsars uh, with uh, very likely neutron star uh, companions. And from, uh, you know, recently we got uh, several binary black holes. So uh, let's start with the uh, accreting ones. Uh, so high mass X-ray binaries. So a high mass X-ray binary is uh, a binary where we have a, 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 a star with the mass of 10 to 20 solar masses, uh, and the compact object, star, in a relatively tight, ob tight uh, orbit. And uh, the compact object is accreting the material from the wind of the uh, uh, massive stars. So we have rays that represent the wind, <laughs> and the wind is accreting here, and we see x-rays. So we see them by the, because they are x-ray sources, and then because we see the x-ray sources, we start to uh, look for a companion. We see a companion, and if the orbital periods match, then we, we know that this is the companion of that uh, particular uh, x-ray binary. And uh, you know, if we if we have uh, eclipses, that then uh, it's even uh, even better. So, uh, how do we make something like that? Uh, 
we have a massive star and we have a compact object. So we must have started from two stars, supposing, you know, this is, this will, this is supposed to turn into a neutron star or a black hole, so it has to have a mass uh, that is relatively large, uh, maybe even larger than the mass of the companion, because it must have evolved quicker. So, uh, supposing it's is a mass of, say, 25 solar masses, and Uh, in such a case, uh, again, this more massive star evolves quicker, and for the massive stars, the, the time scale are relatively short. That will be, you know, in about 10 million years or a few million years. So this star starts to evolve, comes to contact with that star. What will happen in such a case of mass transfer? The mass ratio is close to unity, right? So this is the case that I mm, described in such a <laughs> on, on this complicated graphs that it took me quite a while to understand, and I'm not sure if I didn't go too fast over those. <laughs> but uh, so we expect that uh, there will be a mass ratio reversal. So this. This, this one gains some matter, maybe goes up to 20. We can lose, you know, this will, this, during the, this first episode when uh, the, the mass transfer is not stable and the mass ratio is not reversed yet, we can shed quite some mass, so this will be a non-conservative mass transfer, and uh, uh, we will leave, the, you know, this star will, uh, lose a lot of money and a lot of uh, mass and will become something like a five solar mass Wolfreye star. Uh, then it's going to uh, explode, make a neutron star. Uh, the system may become uh, elliptical in the, uh, so that we can get some ellipticity here. Uh, but not a lot, and it's going to uh, remain bound because, first of all, this is an explosion of a helium star, so you can lose a few solar masses, but it's much less than, the, uh, than half of the total uh, mass of the system. Yeah? It's because you remember that if we lose more than half of the mass of the system, then we don't have a binary and uh, here is a, is a problem. Uh, and uh, uh, this star is something like 20 solar masses. Now, in order for this for the system to be in this state, uh, we don't have a lot of time because we, don't, we cannot let this star uh, evolve, yeah? Because uh, no, it can now accrete uh, from the from the wind, uh, and the wind accretion is uh, uh, relatively uh, harmless because the mass uh, transfer rate is uh, is very low. So the orbit will uh, shrink only uh, very slowly. But what will happen with these systems in like two, three million years? Yeah, this is a massive star. Uh, its, it's evolution, uh, evolutionary time scale are very short. So in two, three million years, it is going to start to expand its radius. Uh, when it expands its radius, it will fill its Roche lobe. And then what we have? We have a mass transfer where uh, we have a massive star uh, very, and a small mass star in, in relation to that one. So this is a perfect recipe for a common envelope. And that may, and because this star has been on a relatively tight orbit to be able to, uh, to accrete matter from the wind, you know, if it was farther away, 
uh, then the matter density in the wind would be low and the accretion rate from the wind would be low, so it would be a very weak X-ray source. Because it's a bright X-ray source, uh, it has to be close, and usually the systems that we see are uh, on the edge of, uh, you know, these stars are on the edge of feeling their, uh, their Roche lobes. So the, they will feel their Roche lobes, the system will start shrinking, will have a common envelope, and most likely will form a torn Zhitkov object, so that the, the compact object will enter uh, into the, the inside uh, of this star, uh, and that's the end of the uh, story. And that's not the, so these are most likely not progenitors of uh, binary compact objects that we see uh, in, um, uh, in gravity waves. Now, low-mass X-ray binaries uh, are uh, a little bit different systems, and they are similar to um, to the, or they are a subclass of the symbiotic systems. So we have a, a low-mass star, like one or less than uh, solar mass, a neutron star, and the star fills its Roche and transfers mass to a neutron star, and the neutron star is then uh, an X-ray uh, pulsar. It can be, uh, in some of these, uh, we have seen the, uh, some periodicities, and these are the perfect examples for the objects where uh, you may have the, which may be the sources of gravitational waves uh, from uh, the um, R mode instabilities, because I don't know if Niels has mentioned this, that there are, they, they typically have uh, the periods or frequencies of about 600 hertz, uh, which uh, is explained. Uh, but the, you know, in principle, the, their periods could be much faster because the matter could spin them to a kilohertz or so. But if we see only uh, that there is, there is a limit in their uh, spin, one of the theories is saying that we try to spin up the star via accretion, but uh, the star at the same time is emitting uh, its uh, rotational energy in the gravitational waves due to the induced uh, R modes and uh, they are potential sources of R modes. So once again, the, the history of the system is uh, similar to the history of the symbiotic stars. Yes, we start with a massive star M1, like 15 solar masses. This has to be a small uh, star. When we, uh, M2, uh, so uh, we, 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 we first have, the, the first mass transfer is stable, uh, it, it must be a common envelope, uh, and after that uh, this star is not accreting a lot of matter because the common envelopes don't take a lot, a lot of time, so it's very difficult to accrete much matter. Uh, the A goes down, yeah. uh, we have a core, of this star, of the mass of three, maybe three solar masses. We have a supernova explosion. We have a neutron star. Neutron star here. And a one solar mass star. Then we wait a few giga years. In the meantime, once we form this, this, is a, this neutron star will be a, a radio pulsar. Uh, so, but uh, the typical time scales for radio pulsars to exist until they slow down below the death line is about 10 to 50 million years. So this is much shorter than the lifetime of that star. So by the time that this star uh, starts to evolve and beca becomes a, a giant, uh, the, this is not no longer. A, a, <clears throat> this is no longer a radio pulsar, and we don't know, maybe over this billion or two or three billion years, uh, the, the, uh, the magnetic field of this uh, neutron star, which, could, which initially should be around 10 to the 12 or so Gauss, 
is decaying to the uh, values characteristic for millisecond pulsars, like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 um, uh, Gauss, uh, which allows for accretion to come practically to the surface of this, uh, of this star. Uh, now, uh, what is going to happen with this star, if, with such a system in the future? What is happening with, with, with its orbit? Is it increasing? Is it uh, typically the mass of a, uh, of a neutron star is something like 1.55 neutron stars and 1.5 solar masses. The mass of the donor is about one solar mass or less. So uh, when we transfer the mass, the system is uh, getting wider. When this, uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have a stable situation, and the, uh, the system is becoming wider. And it will, at some point, the donor will not have the ability to maintain con continuing uh, filling its Roche lobe because of the, you know, it, it, it has to evolve on a nuclear time scale, so it will stop uh, filling its Roche rope, it will start, start collapsing, and it will evolve towards a white dwarf for such low masses, and in the end we'll have a system where we'll have, uh, and when we stop the um, mass transfer, the, this neutron star will keep on spinning, but will not be getting any mass. So if it has a, a magnetic field of the order of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 Gauss, uh, we'll have a system where we'll have a millisecond pulsar, a white dwarf. Yeah? So we have uh, uh, more or less shown that uh, for, from LMXBs, we should obtain a population of neutron star white dwarf binaries, and uh, if that is true, the uh, number, say, formation rate of neutron star white dwarf binaries should be the same as the formation rate of LMXBs, and it's not such an easy comparison because of the uh, selection effect and uh, all of this. Uh, these types of uh, uh, problems. Now, um, binary pulsars. Now, with binary pulsars and black holes, which is what we really uh, want to go to, uh, I have a few um, slides here which show uh, essentially a similar uh, scenario. So, uh, for for the formation of a double neutron star system, we have to go through episodes, and it's not an easy to, to cross, because, well, we have to start from two massive stars, okay? And these two massive stars will, uh, so we have to have something like, say, 20 and 10 solar mass star, and uh, so the first thing that will happen is that there will be a mass transfer from here to here, and uh, because the mass ratio is not uh, extreme, there will be mass ratio reversal. We'll get the core that will be something like 4% of the mass, uh, but this star will become a massive star with... Uh, 20 solar masses or, or so, the orbit is not going to be changed by a lot. This helium star will, uh, the Wolfraya star, will evolve quite quickly. Uh, there will be a bang, will be a supernova explosion and formation of a first neutron star. And uh, then, now, this system at this stage can be a weak high mass uh, stray binary. Uh, and very soon, 
in a couple of million years, this 20 mega million, 20 solar mass star will start uh, evolving. But now, the mass transfer is with a with an extreme uh, mass ratio. So uh, what will happen is that there will be a common envelope here. Uh, and the common envelope uh, can end up in uh, merger, and we have no binary, but if we want to make a, a, a neutron, double neutron star, then uh, we have to tune the initial parameters in such a way that uh, we'll get uh, the, 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 the binary survives, and we have a neutron star or a, and a core, a wolf star with the mass of a few solar masses. Now, uh, if you remember, or I can remind you that uh, the evolution of uh, wolf stars or helium stars can uh, either, uh, f for higher masses, may proceed uh, through the helium giant phase. So if this system is tight enough, we can have, again, uh, <laughs> one more uh, mass transfer if this wolf star uh, becomes a giant and introduces another uh, mass transfer episode with the, with the neutron star. So there may be another mass transfer here, but not necessarily. But then we have... Uh, be this mass transfer or not, we have another supernova explosion and we'll form a neutron star, neutron star uh, binary. And uh, uh, what are the properties of these binaries? Uh, the properties are such that one of these stars, when we observe it, is a young pulsar with strong magnetic field. You no, know, it had no way of interacting with anything. But the first born neutron star, this one, had, must have had an episode when it went through the envelope of that star. So uh, it might have accreted some matter and uh, it's a uh, magnetic field can be quenched by, by accretion. And what is observed is that the typical magnetic fields of the uh, neutron stars in uh, pulsar binaries are much lower than the typical magnetic fields of the pulsars in uh, like solitary young pulsars. They are of the order of 10 to the 10 uh, 10 to the, about 10 to the 10 uh, Gauss. But this must be also young neutron stars. So that means that in this mass transfer episode, there must be some accretion, at least I understand it uh, this way, which quenches the magnetic field of the first born neutron star. And in J0, 737, the only real binary pulsar where we see two pulsars of, as, as binaries, it has been discovered with the, uh, with this, uh, with the emission of the millisecond pulsar, or like 20 millisecond or, or, or so pulsar with low magnetic field, which I think is the first born neutron star, and the companion is a classical uh, pulsar with uh, the uh, longer period and a stronger uh, magnetic field. Uh, okay, so now let me go to uh, the binary black holes. Uh, so here is a, a possible scenario for getting a binary black hole, uh, and uh, this goes as follows. We start with two very massive stars with the masses of 50 and 30 solar masses. Uh, we have, you know, the, the more massive star starts to evolve and uh, uh, transfers quite a significant amount of mass to the 
companion. The companion gains a lot of mass. Now it's 40 solar masses. Here we just we are left with the Wolfreye uh, star of the 15 solar masses, and then uh, the Wolfreye stars have very strong winds. Uh, so over the but with this. Um, masses, they have very short evolutionary times. So from here to here, we have less than a million years, and we can shed half of the mass of the wolf star to, uh, and we have a quiet or, you know, a supernova or a collapse to form a, a black hole. And, you know, you, you have to take all the numbers here with a grain of salt. They, uh, this is just to sketch the process and all of these numbers can vary by a factor of two easily uh, both ways. <laughs> uh, and now we have this massive star with uh, a black hole. And this is the crucial po point in forming uh, the binary uh, black holes because uh, uh, this system has to survive this common envelope where we have uh, the uh, Rauschlob overflow of that massive star with the less massive um, companion that is a, is a black hole. So if we assume that the system survives, you can see that this uh, leads to a rapid shrinkage of the orbit. The orbit shrank from uh, 100 uh, astronomical units, no, that's 100 uh, solar radii to 3 solar radii, so the system becomes much tighter, which solves a lot of problems because if we want to have a merging binary black holes, they have to be on orbits that are with the size that is much smaller than even the size of the binaries in the that we that we began with so uh, we and we get rid of the uh, of the entire envelope we have a system where we have a black hole and a Wolfreye star and this is quite an interesting stage in the whole game because this Wolfreye star is an emitter of a very strong wind and this wind should be accreted by black hole. So at this point, we should have an interesting X-ray source. We have black hole and uh, the mass coming from the wind of the Wolfreye star. So that should be a uh, nice, uh, clear uh, X-ray source. And then this Wolfreye star uh, goes whoom and uh, forms a black hole, and we have a, a, a binary uh, black hole that will happen uh, in spiral until it's detected by LIGO and soon Virgo. Well, in this example, this is about six solar masses, but I can provide you examples with uh, other masses. This is uh, uh, you know, a, a, an example scenario to, 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 to show uh, basically how these things should go, what, what should be the, uh, how, <clears throat> uh, what, what, is, what, what are the, the elements that we need, but we can... The second uh, well, it's, uh, why should it become a black hole? Well, if, uh, you know, if, if, if the initial mass was 28, then it, it got uh, like 12, 15. Because, uh, well, if it was less massive, if, then uh, it would be possible. But I think that if we have a black hole neutron star binary, then... Um, uh, we sh well, it's, it's not that easy to get it because we uh, th this star would have to be initially less massive, and uh, it would get. But it cannot be too low mass because in the case it's too low mass, this tra this mass transfer will be uh, more like a common envelope and will be difficult to survive. And this the secondary is bound to gain a significant fraction of the mass of the uh, primary. 
So uh, you have to tune it very well to make it a black hole neutron star, and that's why it's not so easy to to get them. So 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 then so you have to start from a lower mass, and it cannot be too low. And then you have you, you, you will gain mass from the primary. You cannot help it. Maybe you can shed some mass and make it non-conservative, and then you will be able to. Uh, uh, to, to, to make a less massive wolf star and let it uh, uh, explode as a supernova. But it will not be a standard type 2 because this will be a, an explosion of a wolf star, so it will be without the, the hydrogen lines. Why don't the big star, the big star, the big star, the big well, they can directly collapse to a, to a black hole if the orbit is much larger. If the orbit is much larger initially, they will not come into contact. They will explode as normal supernova. They can still do that. No, they can't do that because be, before they uh, explode the supernova, they come into contact and they have to transfer mass. I'm not saying they will be supernova at all. I'm saying that the gamma is full third. Uh, that could do a direct collapse, yes. yeah. Then you don't have your binary, like but if they do it before any of the uh, system, you will end up uh, with a system uh, which is much wider with the orbit of. I do that in two sequences. I, I, I make the first black hole and then the second black hole later. Then you have a tight binary of 30 solar mass black hole. No, 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 just, but, but uh, at, at what orbital separation do you start? What are you uh, so? Okay, uh, so if you, if you start with a very tight system, then they come to contact immediately, before they, they, they can evolve. If you make it very wide, they, can, they, they may do what you're saying, they will explode as standard supernovae, but they will remain wide and they will never make it to make a merging system. Okay. <laughs> uh, Are there any uh, X-ray sources consistent with this uh, black hole? So there is, uh, I know of two sources uh, that uh, fall into this category. And uh, these are the two sources that really, that made me, uh, sort of convinced me that the, the, there is something in it. Because for a while uh, we, we, we thought that uh, it would be impossible to survive the common envelope and that the common envelope will end up in a merger of uh, the black hole and the wolf star, or the, the giant, and there will be no binary black holes. But because there is an observation of uh, uh, black hole and massive wolf binaries, which is also questioned a little bit because it, it, it's, uh, these are objects within, uh, not in our Milky Way, but in dwarf galaxies. That, uh, so there are some, uh, it's not a straightforward uh, evidence, but it was a hint that sort of told me there may be something in it, that the, uh, this, uh, there may be a way to survive the common envelope and make this, and if we make, if we see this, we are bound to, uh, to see the binary black holes. So, so none of the standard X-ray binaries, like the black hole candidates, like so, for, uh, you know, if, if you look at the standard black hole uh, binaries, when we did a study of, of, of those uh, a while ago, uh, for example, I think Cygnus X1 is likely, with a very low probability, to make a black hole neutron star binary. Uh, but uh, it's not going to be a, a binary black hole. So, um, even HMX with high mass binaries. for the high mass X ray binaries, the problem is that they, the ones that we observe are uh, on two short orbits, two tight orbits, and you know, so they are sitting somewhere uh, here in this scenario. Here yeah, we have a, a, a star and a, and a compact object. 
Okay? So they are before what I call the bottleneck of the entire scenario. Uh, if they are before the, this, this bottleneck, uh, we, the, the, no, the, the, this is, as, as you saw, this is a very uncertain part. It's very roughly parameterized, so it's better to uh, use some observational handle to be sure that uh, we can survive it. And depending on the, what happens in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, episode, they uh, may merge or uh, they uh, may form binaries if there is, you know, if, if this star has relatively low mass and there will be a supernova with a proper kick, you can make it survive and make a black hole neutron star uh, uh, binary from uh, from that, but I think that the ones that we observe in X-rays are these are the objects that will be very difficult to be the progenitors of uh, binary compact objects. There may be objects with where there is a star and a black hole which are on a wider uh, orbit, and they are not observed in X-rays, but they may be observed and they may be discovered by Gaia when we see proper motions uh, of binaries and we see them as visual uh, binaries and we infer that the uh, uh, companion should be a neutron hole. So it remains to be seen. But I think that uh, this is in general a very important thing that if this scenario is to, to be believed, it's not that we explain, ops, here is a story and we end up with this. We have to have uh, observational evidence of everything that happens on the way.